Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. This is week 68. And this week, actually, I got some really interesting topics, I think. Uh, something that's a little bit different than usual. Um, we have some mystery drones that are flying over nuclear power plants, so I'll talk about that. Uh, DJI is extending a privacy mode that they had on a different app to the regular DJI Go 4 app. And then I want to talk about UTM. I want to talk about a new face for UTM. And if you're not familiar with UTM, I'll explain a little bit more about what it is. And then lastly, I want to have a discussion about drones made in the USA, because this is something that we see popping a lot these days. So let's get going. The first thing this week is I want to talk about drones that are flying over nuclear power plants. And this came from a Forbes article. And, uh, and I thought the article was actually very well written. Lots of uh, data that was collected. They put a FOIA request, which is a Freedom of Information Act request. And uh, the author found that there were 57 drone incursions that were flown over 24 different nuclear sites across the country. And that happened between 2015 and 2019. So it's still a fairly wide uh, range of, uh, of, of time. But what I found interesting in here is that there were five incidents out of all of these 57. There were five incidents that were marked as resolved and over 80% of the rest of them, so over 80% of the entire amount there was marked as unresolved, closed but unresolved, meaning that they don't really know who was flying over these nuclear power plants. And uh, one of them in particular, actually two of them in particular, one in Pennsylvania and one in Palo Verde in Arizona, reported that they had uh, at, at least during one event, they had five or six drones flying at the same time over uh, an area, over unit, they call it unit three, one of the reactor, I guess, uh, for over 80 minutes, over a specific uh, period of time, five to six drones total that they saw flying for 80 minutes. Now this would match, what it says in the article, would match a, a typical uh, mapping mission or surveying mission of the area. Same thing happened in Pennsylvania. And uh, half of these sites actually have reported more than one incident. The interesting part about this is that uh, Palo Verde, for example, is equipped with a drone detection technology that is supposed to detect where the operator is actually located within a 13 mile radius, which is actually very large. A, and in, in the case of one of the incidents, actually that didn't work. They weren't able to figure out what was happening and who was flying and where they were. So. The reason I'm talking about all this is because, well, the first thing is I, I look at this and I think about, okay, what is the threat of a drone on a nuclear power plant? And as it turns out, if you do some research, you find out that these reactors are designed to withstand a crash of an airliner, actually, onto the, uh, the reactor. So a drone in itself, a drone strike would not really create that much damage. But the, in, the interesting part about the article is they talk about a different type of site where they have above ground storage pools that have spent nuclear fuel. And that is way more of a vulnerability. Apparently these are getting cooled off using, uh, using water, I'm guessing. And uh, if there was any attacks on there, then it could drain the liquid from these pools and then, and then create an issue with temperature. So um, the reason I'm talking about all this is I, I think this is an interesting topic that we're gonna see again in the future. This is something that our industry is gonna have to learn to deal with. Um, you and I want to do good things with drones. Other people are going to be using drones to weaponize them, to create terrorist attack and to do other things. So it's something that we have to be ready for. It's not a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when this is going to happen. So the, the, the counter drone technology in this case obviously is not always working properly, but for sites like this, uh, more regulation obviously is not going to really help and do much of anything. But uh, having the, the drone detection technology and the anti-drone technology uh, in those areas is absolutely critical. So um, I just thought it was interesting. I'm gonna put a link down here if you want to read it. And, uh, and I don't know if we'll see a follow-up on this or not. The next thing is DJI. They're talking about expanding their data privacy mode. Now, if you follow me for a while, you've heard me talk about DJI and privacy issues for over a year now. Uh, this seems to be in the, in the news almost every week and especially in the last uh, few months. 
it feels like DJI has been under attack by just being uh, targeted by uh, different reports and uh, from, from companies that go through their software and find loopholes and or holes, I should say security holes. Um, in this case, DJI is basically coming out and saying that they will extend what they call the local data mode. And the local data mode is only available at the moment on their enterprise, the enterprise version of their app. It's called a pilot, DJI pilot app. And, um, and the mode basically allows you to disconnect from the internet completely. And this is something that they had created in response to critiques that said that the drone connects to uh, a server in China and then uploads the data. And so they had created this mode uh, for their enterprise drones and for the government edition drones where you can turn off basically everything. Uh, they are saying that now they will make this available in the GoFor app and in the DJI Fly app. So you'll have the ability to turn on the local data mode. Um, interestingly, I'm trying to find more information. I've, I've, I've never actually played with the uh, this mode. I've never really had a chance to use it, but uh, it looks like there is kind of two different ways to use it. One is a full, completely local data mode, no connection to the internet whatsoever. And one is where you're allowed to get mapping information so that you can still have access to the maps on the drone itself. Now, my question would be, what happens when you get into a, um, uh, an area that requires authorization? If you don't have access to the internet, obviously you can get immediate authorization. Now, uh, personally, I do get my authorizations to fly my DJI drones before I get to the site. And all I have to do is just uh, basically turn it on right here. And then I don't need to have access to the internet. So uh, I, it just, it's gonna, if, if you're gonna be turning this on, you need to understand the repercussions of not having access to any data. Uh, interestingly, there was a company called FTI Consulting that completed an audit of the local data mode. And they actually confirmed that it is internet tight uh, unless you you turn on the uh, the map map box is the company that they use for the map it's a it's an american third party uh, mapping provider and uh, and when you turn that on then it does send data back and forth between uh, the mapping company and your and your uas so i just thought it was interesting and i would share so when whenever that pops up on go for i will let you know and uh, we have a bunch of courses where we talk about the app so we will be updating those as it comes up um, the next topic is UTM and uh, the FA, so UTM, unmanned or, or unmanned aircraft system, UAS, and uh, TM, traffic management. So it's an unmanned traffic management system. It's the equivalent of air traffic control or air traffic management, but for, uh, for drones, for unmanned vehicles. And that's pretty much the, the 400 feet of airspace that we have available for drone pilots is, con is going to be controlled by UTM. At the moment, UTM is still a concept, and uh, there is a, a great document called ConOps, and it's a concept of operation that the FAA has created, and they talk about UTM. And, and uh, the, the first phase of UTM was a pilot program, it's called UPP, so UTM Pilot Program. This is, this is, I just realized, UPP is actually an acronym within an acronym, because the U in UTM is already an acronym, so anyway. Uh, so UPP was different sites across the country that ran different scenarios and did research on what the concept of UTM should be. And now the FA has uh, stopped this program. And now we go into the next phase, phase two, where they selected two different sites, one in Virginia and one in New York, where they're going to be doing testing on remote ID concepts, if you want. So, um, We'll see what comes out of this. Uh, for sure, we'll be reporting on this when I get more information. Uh, I think UTM is, is one of the hot topics out there. Obviously, Remote ID is one of them. I think UTM is, is definitely something to look into because, because we're all gonna have to live in the UTM world at one point and share information between uh, what I call crude uh, unmanned aircraft. So you and I flying our drones around, doing inspections, doing photography, whatever you do and then uncrewed or autonomous flights like the Amazon deliveries and the FedEx deliveries and all of that. So uh, we'll have to all play together and this is why the FAA is coming up with this UTM concept and uh, trying to make sure that everyone can talk to each other, including uh, aircraft on the ground, aircraft that are flying in the UTM uh, space. So if you think about helicopters flying at low altitude, if you think about crop dusters flying at low altitude, and, uh, and there's some really interesting information in that ConOps document uh, talking about how 
the the man aircraft are going to have to kind of start playing uh, along with uh, unmanned aircraft once we start getting more congested in the airspace. So I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion in the future when uh, the FAA starts to change regulation and says that, well, uh, manned aircraft have had priority all this time and they are expecting that this will change over time where if you're going to be flying below 400 feet AGL then you're going to have to kind of play nice with other aircraft, other unmanned aircraft that are in the airspace. So um, <laughs> I see some heated conversations around the corner when that happens but uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And the last topic this week I want to talk about is drones made in the USA because this is something that I've seen popping for the last couple of weeks, especially since uh, we reported on the, the Blue UAS, which was the, the five different manufacturers that the Department of Defense uh, approved in order to fly uh, for the, uh, well, for the Department of Defense. So uh, this list came out and there's five aircraft that were approved and that are safe to fly and because they're made in the USA. So um, Hotel this week, Hotel is a Chinese company. I know that a lot of people don't, uh, don't either don't know that or, or uh, well, they just don't know it. Uh, but Hotel, which is a Chinese based company, this week they advertised that their new Hotel, the Evo 2 Dual, was going to be made in the USA. And it says made in the USA from foreign and US components and US labor. So the FLIR that they have on this drone is an American camera. FLIR is American. You have the Sony sensor, which is a Japanese uh, company. And then you have the uh, frame in itself that is made in China. So <clears throat> it's a Chinese frame with American components that is made with American labor. So that, I guess, warrants the, the title of Made in the USA. And, I, and I'm not criticizing this, by the way, I'm just explaining. Um, the interesting part that I find about all this is, to me personally, I don't really care where the drone specifically is made. Well, actually, I guess I do. I do care that it's made in the USA because it creates job in our country. But with that being said, in terms of from a security perspective, I don't care where the drone is made. What I care about is where the software is made and where the software, remember, if you have a data leak, like we've been talking about potential data leaks from DJI, um, the, the data leak comes from where the, the software was made. The software is what sends the data. Uh, the, the, so the, the sensor, the FLIR camera, the Sony sensor is what captures the data. Whatever happens to that data that's being captured is done by the software. So we need to focus more, I think, on the fact of where is the drone, where is the, the, the software made, and does the software have holes? And if the software is made in China and it has holes, then we need to talk about this. If it's made in the USA and it has holes, then we need to also talk about this. So this is where we have the, the security flaws is going to be at the software level. So anyway, I thought I'd have this quick discussion about this, about drones made in the USA, you need to understand what it means and you need to be really researching when you want to um, when you want to support an American company, you have to think about what they are actually doing, what kind of parts are they using and what kind of software are they using to go with it. So, okay, I'll get off my uh, soapbox. We, this is it for this week. And, uh, and as always, if you have any comments, leave them down in here. If you're not subscribed, then uh, it's time to go ahead and do that. And then I will see you guys next week.